uh, we will be recording this lecture and uh, I will be sending it out to everyone who has uh, registered. Uh, this evening's virtual lecture will be given by Dr. Brandon Erickson and Derek Lee, uh, physical therapist with SPEAR. Um, er Dr. Erickson is one of our sports medicine and shoulder surgeons here at Rothman Orthopedics. Uh, Dr. Erickson did complete his residency um, in orthopedics at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, while he was there, he did help cover the Chicago White Sox as well as the Chicago Bulls. He then completed his sports medicine fellowship and shoulder fellowship at um, Hospital for Special Surgery in Manhattan, uh, where he then was also assisting team physicians for the New York Mets. Currently, Dr. Erickson is actually assisting as a team physician for Philadelphia Phillies, and he was also elected to um, Major League Baseball uh, for the Pitch Smart Committee to help with injury, injury prevention in baseball players at all levels of play. He cares for patients of all ages and activity levels and has particular interest in the shoulder, especially shoulder replacements. Uh, Dr. Erickson is currently seeing patients at our Harrison, Tarrytown, and Manhattan offices um, I would also like to introduce our other presenter, Derek Lee, physical therapist with Spear Physical Therapy. Uh, Derek is actually the clinical director of uh, Murray Hills location. Uh, Derek does take special interest in pain neuroscience education, functional strengthening, as well as uh, sports injury prevention. Uh, today's topic will be uh, that Dr. Erickson and Derek will be covering is uh, shoulder replacements and everything that you need to know. And uh, Dr. Erickson, I turn it over to you. Great, all right, thanks, Reggie. So let me just share my screen with everybody so you can see it. You guys see that screen okay? Excellent, all right. So uh, I'm Brandon Erickson. Thank you everybody for uh, joining our webinar today. I'll talk to you a little bit about shoulder replacements. Who gets these, when do we do them, why do we do them? And so I have some disclosures, none of them are relevant to this talk. So first of all, why do we even bother talking about shoulder replacements? What's the point of this lecture? Well, what we know, I'm sorry, let me see if this advances here. All right, so what we know is that there's hundreds of thousands of patients who suffer from shoulder arthritis annually, all right? And the, the issue with this is actually it's growing at a pretty rapid rate. You can see it's almost a 10% annual growth rate in the number of shoulder replacements that we see each year. And some of the studies that have modeled this out have actually seen almost an 800% increase in the number of patients that have shoulder replacements over the age of 55 by the time we get to 2030. If you take a look at this study here that was looking at basically the incidence of shoulder replacements, specifically in the United States, they used a big um, nationwide registry and they looked at U.S. Census data. And what they found was that from 2012 to 2017, the number of reverse shoulder replacements, and I'll explain what that is a little bit later, went from 7.3 cases per 100,000 people up to 19.3. So it almost tripled. And the anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty, or TSA, went from about 10 cases to 12 and a half. So going up, but not quite as quickly. If you take a look at the numbers here, you can see in 2012, there were just under, uh, just over 60,000 of these being performed. And in 2017, you're looking at almost 100,000. You can see here the growth rate of the anatomic and the reverse shoulder replacement. So it's going up at a very high rate, okay? And so it's an important issue for us to talk about because we're seeing it a lot in our office and our patients are suffering from this a lot. And so let me explain to you a little bit about why some people get arthritis. There's actually a lot of causes of shoulder arthritis. First of all, we can get the kind of run of the mill, if you will, glenohumeral arthritis or osteoarthritis. And that's shown by this picture here, where sometimes you'll get a little extra bone that forms at the bottom of the joint. And the reason that extra bone forms is because when you have arthritis, you basically have loss of some of the cartilage in your shoulder. And what happens is that's painful. And so the body's response to pain is to have you not move that shoulder. So it forms this extra bone so that you can't move the shoulder as well, so that it doesn't hurt you to move. It. Another type of arthritis is what we call rotator cuff tear arthropathy. It's a fancy word for basically saying your rotator cuff doesn't work and it hasn't worked for a long time. And because of that, the mechanics of your shoulder have changed. And so you can see that that, that ball and socket joint is no longer ascended. That ball is slid very high up there, evidenced by this arrow. And so that's another type of arthritis. Some people dislocate their shoulder a lot. And if you dislocate your shoulder many times over many years, you can also develop arthritis in the shoulder. And you can also get it if you have a bad fracture of the shoulder. You can see here that there's many pieces going on in that ball there. It's knocked off a few of the main components of the shoulder. And this can lead to arthritis down the road. 
So let's talk about glenohumeral arthritis. Why do people get this, the kind of standard osteoarthritis? Some people have a family history of it. Sometimes the dominant arm is more affected than the non-dominant arm just because of what you do. And also occupation can play a role in this. If you're a heavy laborer, if you lift overhead a lot for your job, that can sometimes put you at risk for getting osteoarthritis. For rotator cuff tear arthropathy, this is the rotator cuff issue. So these are either chronic tears that happen over time, or they can be acute tears where, let's say you dislocated your shoulder, or you fell down the stairs, that can cause a big rotator cuff tear, that can cause a major, cause a major problem down the road in your shoulder. The post-traumatic, like we talked about, is kind of those recurrent dislocations or those fractures that people can have. And all of these causes can, can lead to shoulder arthritis. And the issue with shoulder arthritis is that it affects people a lot. So it can affect your activities of daily living, just simple things like putting dishes up in a shelf or getting food out of a microwave that's above your shoulder level can sometimes be very difficult for people with shoulder arthritis. Certainly athletics, golf, tennis, a lot of our patients love to play golf and tennis as they get a little bit older. And we want them to do that because we want people to be active. That's the best thing to keep people healthy. And we don't want something like shoulder arthritis to prevent you from doing the things that you want to do. Pain can be a big issue with people who have arthritis, especially at night for some reason. We're not sure why it really wakes people up at night, but shoulder arthritis, more so than knee and hip arthritis, really tends to wake people up at night and it can really disrupt people's sleep patterns. And also a lot of our patients complain of clicking and locking and grinding with some crepitation uh, that can be very disturbing to them and also cause the shoulder to almost get stuck and they kind of have to shake the shoulder a little bit to get it loose and that can be very painful. And then of course you can lose your function. So a lot of people will start to lose their range of motion because of that extra bone that I told you the shoulder forms that can actually become a mechanical block to motion. So you can push the shoulder all day, but it's not going to move past a certain point because there's actually a mechanical block. And then of course strength can go down because the rotator cuff is no longer doing its job. And I would tell you that shoulder arthritis, it's a little bit less talked about than hip and knee arthritis. A lot of people have hip and knee arthritis and a lot of people have shoulder arthritis. The reason people tolerate shoulder arthritis a little better than hip and knee arthritis is the shoulder is not really a weight bearing joint, whereas the hip and knee, you're constantly walking on this. So it's very hard to avoid using your hip and knee, but you can start to modify your lifestyle and not use your shoulder, which is something that we don't want you to do. We want you to be able to use your shoulder, but some people become um, a little bit scared about their shoulder and don't want to necessarily get it checked out. So rather than take care of it, they'll kind of stop doing certain activities. Um, and oftentimes it's activities that they like doing, which is unfortunate. Um, and there's other things that come into play also. We're not really sure if weight loss helps with shoulder arthritis, where it does with hip and knee arthritis. Um, but both of them, regardless of if you're suffering for shoulder or hip and knee arthritis, if you come to see us in the office, the first step that we always try is a course of non-operative management, because sometimes these therapies can be very effective for people with shoulder arthritis. So just because you have shoulder arthritis doesn't mean you have to have a shoulder replacement. The only time we talk about things like that or if these non-operative treatments fail. And these non-operative treatments can vary greatly. We can start, we always start with physical therapy. That's why we have Derek and his group on the call today. And Derek does a great job with a lot of my patients who have shoulder arthritis. He improves their function. He gets their pain better. And so a lot of times this can help patients a lot. We often use anti-inflammatory medications. We don't want to use them for a very long time, but in short spurts, they can be very effective. Steroid injections can also be very effective. These oftentimes are temporary, uh, but sometimes they can actually provide a good amount of relief, although it usually is for a short period of time. And then there's the gel shots that you hear us talk a lot about in the knees. These aren't approved for um, use in the shoulder yet by the FDA. We do use them sometimes, but unfortunately insurance doesn't cover these. So it's not clear whether or not this provides a long-term benefit as well. Similar to other types of shots like PRP, stem cells, things like that. They're out there and we can always do them if somebody really wants them, but I can't tell you that these are going to be very effective long term for your shoulder arthritis. Now I put this up here just to mention, you know, steroids can be effective, uh, but they can also cause problems. So if you have a steroid shot in the shoulder, we generally try to avoid operating on that shoulder, especially from a shoulder replacement perspective for at least three months, because your risk of infection if you have surgery is a little bit elevated if you've had a steroid injection in the last three months. So if you ever come see me and you've had a steroid shot before and you want the shoulder replaced, we just have to wait a little bit of time to make sure that we're safe when we do it. And so there's a few options if those non-operative treatments fail for shoulder arthritis. And I'll talk to you about mostly replacements today, but I just want you to know there are some other options arthroscopically where we can kind of clean up some of the arthritis, take care of the biceps tendon, which can be a problem sometimes, clean up some of those bone spurs. But oftentimes this is not a long-term solution. This is more of a short-term two to three year maybe solution. And then oftentimes these patients wind up having shoulder replacements. Now that picture in the middle is of that anatomic shoulder replacement I told you about. And so the ball stays where it is and the socket stays where it is. 
in the picture on the far right, that's a reverse shoulder replacement. We've now switched where the ball and the socket are, and I'll explain to you in a little bit why we do each one. Now, as we've evolved over time doing shoulder replacements, our implants have gotten better and better. This is actually the anatomic replacement that I use now, and you can see that it's a stemless device, so you have to take very little bone, uh, which is excellent in case we ever had to go back for a revision surgery, uh, and patients generally have a lot less pain with this because we don't have to put that stem down the canal. And you can't see what I've done on the socket side there, but this little white line right here, there's a plastic piece over here and this little white line is my indicator that that's in the right spot you want that at about the 50 yard line here and you can see that's exactly where I want it now sometimes if somebody has a fracture we do it a little bit differently they still get a reverse replacement like over here but we use we try to put those pieces back together around the implant so that they can wind up with better shoulder function down the road and so the purpose of doing a shoulder replacement for people is to first and foremost get rid of your pain. That is always the main reason to do a shoulder replacement. We oftentimes will get better motion back and we, we can kind of maintain or even improve your motion, but that's not the primary purpose of doing this. The primary reason to do a shoulder replacement is to help with pain. Um, certainly we oftentimes will improve the quality of life of these patients because they have oftentimes been avoiding doing certain things for a long time. They may not even know how much pain they've had. Um, and once they have their shoulder replaced after a few months, they feel great and they start doing things they haven't done in many years. Uh, and then of course, getting back to sports, golf, tennis, whatever sport you like, um, is something we very much encourage after we do the shoulder replacements. Um, you know, within reason, of course, not probably not going back to playing in the, you know, pro tennis tour, but certainly playing recreationally with friends. That's certainly what we want you to get back to doing. And so I'll go, a little, I'll go over a little bit what the process is like for a shoulder replacement. And again, this is for people who've tried the non-operative things and they haven't worked. And they're, they're kind of saying, all right, we need to do something about this because I'm not doing well. And so what happens is I'll see in the office, we do a physical exam. I take a look at your motion, make sure that we're on the same page with your diagnosis. We get some x-rays and then we talk about what to do. Um, and oftentimes we'll have a discussion about what the replacement process is like. And I'll go over that in a second. And then oftentimes I'll get a CT scan or CAT scan on your shoulder, sometimes an MRI, but always a CAT scan. Um, and this helps me to plan your surgery out ahead of time because I actually do your surgery first uh, on my computer in a planning software. And then I use a specific guide that's tailored to you when I do the procedure. So that way we make sure we put the implants in exactly the right spot where I want them. Okay. And we also have to, again, like I said before, decide on the type of shoulder replacement. Now the type of shoulder replacement can be one of two, like we said, it can be an anatomic or it can be a reverse. The anatomic shoulder replacement where we keep the ball in the socket where they are is for people whose rotator cuff is functioning well, because you have to have the rotator cuff functioning to keep the ball centered in the socket. If the rotator cuff is not functioning and you try to do an anatomic replacement, the ball will dislocate or you won't have very good power of your shoulder because those muscles that are used to power the shoulder are not there anymore. I'll show you in a minute why we do the reverse shoulder replacement and how the implant design is very different and how it changes the mechanics of the shoulder. Now, this is what I get when I get the CT scan. This is what you've gone to get ahead of time, and it tells me a couple of different angles that I have to measure so that I know exactly where we need to put your shoulder replacement to get you the best outcome. I get this little 3D planning software after I've uploaded your CT scan, and I can change all kinds of things in this. I can change where I, the position I want it, I can change the size of the implant, I can change the screws, and so I have a great idea going into surgery what we need. Now, of course, I have every implant avail to, available to me in the operating room, but it's always good to have a plan going in because you don't want your surgery to be very different than your plan. You want to have a really good idea of what it should take because we already know what your anatomy is based on these scans that we've done. And this is the guide that I get printed out for me and I can actually put this, it's not printed out, it's a metal guide, but we have certain feet that we set on it and allows me to put the pin for that socket in exactly the right position. And so you can see here that sometimes in these, and sometimes people who have uh, very bad arthritis is this picture on the right, you actually start to wear away part of the socket, but not concentrically. It, the head starts to kind of slide towards the back and it actually creates a new socket over here. So the whole socket will go from here to here, but you see it's only articulating or moving with this part of the socket back here. And if this goes on for a long time, this can cause a big problem in the shoulder and it can be very difficult to put a shoulder replacement in. And we have to use some special implants to make sure we put it in the right spot. Now, I mentioned the rotator cuff before to you, and the rotator cuff is made up of four muscles. And again, I told you it kind of functions to center that humerus within the glenoid or center the ball within the socket, okay? It's very critical for shoulder motion. And when that doesn't happen, you can see here with the picture on the left that that ball starts to ride high. It doesn't sit well centered in the socket anymore. And now it's sitting up here. It's not centered over here like it's supposed to be. And so this is why we do this reverse shoulder replacement. You don't have to have a rotator cuff that functions to do this reverse shoulder replacement. You can see here, because we've switched where the ball on the socket are, we've now changed the mechanics of the shoulder. And so we've completely gotten rid of the need for the rotator cuff. And we now use your deltoid 
rhomboid muscle, which is that big muscle on the outside of your shoulder to power your shoulder replacement. This is just a fancy picture to show you basically biomechanically what that does. And to show you that the implant design, as it changes, it gets much more stable than if you do the kind of anatomic regular shoulder replacement. Now, we used to do these shoulder replacements in patient, and patients would stay for a couple of days in the hospital. We've kind of migrated over time as our techniques have gotten better and our medicines have gotten better um, to doing these in the outpatient setting. I would say I probably do 80 to 85% of my shoulder replacements as an outpatient. Sometimes we do them in the hospital, but patients can go home the same day. Um, it just depends on your health status. Uh, if you're sick, we usually let keep you in the hospital. If you're relatively healthy and feel comfortable, then we let you go home. It's not to say that you have to have the surgery either inpatient or outpatient. It's just that, just that this has become a nice option for us. And people generally tend to feel better when they're home rather than staying in the hospital. So this has become a very nice option for us in the last few years. And people, in my experience, actually really enjoy this a lot. You can see here that when they looked at all the outcomes for having the surgery in a hospital or in the, surgery, in the uh, outpatient center, um, there were no differences in, in any of the outcomes. Now, if you decide you want to go ahead with the shoulder replacement, again, you've gotten that CAT scan. And now a few days before surgery, I actually had you take this uh, benzoyl peroxide wipe and have you wipe over the area where we're going to make the incision for the shoulder replacement because it actually gets rid of one of the bugs that lives on your skin called P-acnes. They renamed it C-acnes recently, but, but the P-acnes bug, uh, because this can be a problem with infections in the shoulder. It's very unlikely that it would happen, less than 1% chance of getting an infection, but this can help us kind of decrease or mitigate that risk of getting an infection after surgery if we have you wipe the area with this beforehand because it kills that bug. Now for the surgery itself, what we do here is we kind of go in between two muscles. We go in between your deltoid and your pec muscle. Okay, so we don't actually have to cut any of that muscle when we go in. And as we start to go in, we locate your biceps tendon and we actually relocate that to hook up to your pec muscle over there. You can see it here, that's the biceps tendon. And then we get to the shoulder. Now one of the rotator cuff muscles is in our way. That's called the subscapularis. That's one of the rotator cuff muscles in the front of your shoulder over here. Now to get access to your shoulder joint, I have to make an incision in that rotator cuff muscle. So I'm going to repair that on my way out. And and Derek's going to talk to you in a little bit about why it's so important for the first few weeks to avoid doing certain things when we start doing therapy, do certain motions in a very controlled manner because we have to get this tendon to heal, especially if we do an anatomic replacement. If it doesn't heal, the shoulder's not going to function properly. And almost always it does heal, but we have to, be, we have to avoid doing certain things in the first few weeks to make sure that it does heal. So once we've kind of exposed that, then you can see here, this is what the shoulder looks like. This is the ball, and you can see it's kind of abnormally shaped. It's not shaped like a round ball anymore. It's kind of flat because it's worn away, and there's this big extra piece of bone down here that doesn't belong. And what we do is we actually cut that arthritis away with the saw, as you can see here, and then we expose the socket side. This is the socket. There's no more cartilage left on here. Cartilage is kind of a white, glossy surface. You can see this is kind of yellow and looks like bone. That's because that is bone. And so then what we do is we put that plastic piece in. Now, again, this is for that anatomic replacement. We put that plastic piece in to now function as the socket side. And then we get back over to the, the ball side and we put in that stemless implant design that goes in here. And then what we do is we close that subscapularis tendon with some sutures or sometimes some suture anchors on the way out. And that gives a very robust repair. Okay. And so that's what the process is like after a shoulder replacement. Now, the recovery from this and I'll let Derek talk to this a little bit more from a therapy perspective, but from my perspective, like I said, you go home the same day, sometimes you stay a night in the hospital. Um, I see you back in the office in about seven to 10 days. You have a dressing over you here that's waterproof, and so actually you can shower the same day if you'd like. You can take the sling off and shower. Um, I just don't have you lift the arm away from the body for the first few weeks, and again, that's to let that subscapularis tendon heal. I see you back in the office in about two weeks. We get that dressing off. We make sure everything looks good, and then we start therapy around the four-week mark, and Derek will talk to you about exactly what we do when we start physical therapy. Sometimes we start a little sooner, sometimes a little after. Um, everybody's a little bit different, uh, but that's generally what we do, and then I see you back again at the six-week mark and around the three-month mark and make sure things are going well. And if they are going well, usually by the three to four month mark, we have you start chipping and putting from a golf perspective, maybe taking some underhand tennis swings. And by the time you get to that five month mark, sometimes six months, we have you pretty much going back to sports as you'd like to and as you can tolerate because by that point, your motion's back to normal, your strength's back to normal, and hopefully your pain is significantly less than before we started this whole process. Now, again, these are some of the common questions that I get. You know, how long do I have to stay in the sling? Usually that's about four to six weeks, depending on how you're doing. And like I said, day one, you can come out of that sling to bend and straighten your elbow, type, right, feed yourself. That's totally fine. Again, I just don't want you lifting the arm away from the body to protect that rotator cuff tendon in the front. 
Driving is a little bit of a different story. Sometimes it's about two to, th two to three weeks. Sometimes it's four weeks. It depends on you and how you're recovering and how comfortable you are with driving. We certainly don't want you to have the sling on when you're driving. We want you to be off of your pain medicine when you drive. So that's very important. The golf cup thing, like I talked about, usually around the three and a half month mark, we can have start to have you know chipping and putting a little bit. Um, and then we get a little further out, have you swinging some irons and of course getting back to the driver. And then as far as limitations go after surgery, I really don't put limitations on you after surgery. I kind of let you go back to do the thing, doing the things that you want to do because um, it's the whole point of you having the shoulder replaced. Now, if you have that reverse replacement, will you have complete full motion of your shoulder? No, there's a little bit of a trade-off with that reverse because we have to compromise a little bit of the motion to make sure that the shoulder gets stable. So usually people get up to about 140 degrees. Sometimes going behind your back can be a little difficult, but usually when you're having that replacement, you haven't done those things in a really long time. So actually your motion usually does get better. It's just not as good as it probably once was. So to kind of bring it all together here, we know shoulder arthritis is very different than hip and knee arthritis. When non-operative management fails, and again, we always start with this, um, that's when we progress to things like an anatomic or reverse shoulder replacement. These are very good options with very good outcomes in our patients. Um, as I said, people often go home the same day. Sometimes they stay a night in the hospital. That just depends on you and how you're feeling. And then rehabilitation, first we start with motion, and then we start to strengthen. I didn't go into this much because this is going to be what Derek's going to talk to you about. Um, these are just some references for kind of issues with the biceps, the elbow, the shoulder, uh, if you have any interest in it. So thank you very much for your time. And I will turn the presentation. That's my new four-month-old daughter and, and my wife. She actually has been very quiet during this presentation, which is excellent. Um, but we just had her. Her name is Brooke, and she's doing excellent. So I'm going to pass this off to Derek now. We'll talk a little about the therapy. All right. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Appreciate that. Uh, I was actually very impressed that uh, Brooke did stay quiet. I was expecting a little uh, uh, screech here and there, but that's uh, that was great. Uh, thank you very much for that again, and thank you all, all of you for being here and, and kind of listening in for this presentation. Like I said, my name is Derek. I'm a physical therapist as well as a clinical director at Spear in Murray Hill. Um, I am very happy to be here today. I think this sort of thing is really important to educate people on um, because it's a big decision. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, significant surgery, and I think people often go into it with anxiety and, and some fears. And I, my goal for today would be able to, you know, give somebody, give people the um, understanding of what this process is like, especially following surgery into the rehab process where I'll kind of be the one taking over. Um, so, like I said, kind of goals for today. We're looking at, um, we're going to learn about just the rehab protocols in general uh, for both the total and the reverse total shoulder replacement, and just kind of understanding the common rehab progression, what you're going to be doing at different stages, as well as just overall prognosis for uh, this type of surgery. Uh, and then also just kind of following up with just common exercises, common sorts of things you're going to be doing throughout the whole rehab process. Um, so this sort of thing, I, I, as physical therapists, you're often seeing people with this pain, with this dysfunction, like Dr. Erickson's mentioned, prior to surgery. Um, this is an option that most surgeons are going to recommend first. Uh, and so you're, you're talking to myself or a physical, a physical therapist about this sort of thing um, and what your options are. Uh, as a PT, uh, you know, typically I'm educating people about people turn to surgery whenever this is uh, something you've tried conservative management for multiple times, you've tried therapy for a while, you tried injections, you've tried medications or a combination of all that, uh, and it's still bothering you. It's still limiting you. You're not doing what you want to do. You still have a lot of pain. And I tell people that when that gets to a point where it's affecting your life very negatively, you're not doing what you, what you like. Um, I often see people get depressed because they can't do things that they can't, they're, they're used to doing. That's when the conversation turns to this surgery is very viable. The surgery very much will reduce pain and often improve your uh, function and emotion. So that's usually my, my delineation for that. Um, I like to tell people what to expect before going into the surgery. That way they just have an awareness of what uh, they're going to be going through. Uh, this sort of thing maybe may fluctuate depending on um, the type of surgery you get, uh, you know, patient to patient, depending on what their history is and that sort of thing. But initially, uh, you're going to be immobile, not just your shoulder, but yourself. You know, you, you can't drive for a period of time, four or six weeks usually. Um, you're not going to be using uh, the shoulder like you're used to for that first six weeks. You're mostly going to be in a sling um, outside of doing some therapy and some exercises. And then no lifting anything for, for usually about at least six weeks or around that period. Um, so important to know going into it. And then just the length. Um, this is also kind of dependent on a lot of people. Three to four months is a general 
you know, just trying to return to normal life and they feel kind of normal. And uh, three to four months is what I'll tell people that uh, is usual, usually most of the improvement will happen. Um, if you're trying to return to a higher level of sport or, or, or you're, you know, um, your rehab maybe a little bit slower, it could be up to you know, six months that you're doing most of what you want to do. I like to tell people that this sort of procedure though is it's, um, it's one that you can often get better at or you can often get improvements in uh, for up to almost two years after surgery. I've seen patients that, um, you know, uh, kind of are two years out and they're like, oh, actually this does feel better than it did even 12 months ago. So um, it's, it's, a slow pro it's a slow progression, but usually six months is, is about the length of time um, or three or four months is about the length of time. Um, and then outcomes. Most people ex experience significant improvements in your pain and function after the surgery. So definitely a very viable option. Uh, first day, uh, PT is going to be talking to you about your history. Uh, we want to know what it was like prior to surgery, um, what your dysfunction was like, um, and what was leading up to it, what was the reasoning for your pain, dysfunction, uh, as well as what you were able to do prior to surgery and how long you were able to do that for. Uh, all that stuff's important because it shapes kind of our ability to understand how much better the shoulder is going to get or how, what, or what type of um, range of motion and strength we should expect to see um, as you progress. Uh, and then also just the type of surgery is very important as I'll get into here uh, in a little bit. And as Dr. Erickson mentioned, the type of surgery heavily influences the uh, rehab process and we'll consult a physician or, or a script for that sort of uh, thing. And then you what your goals are. Uh, it's very important. As you get to a point in therapy, um, you know, if you have goals of playing tennis, of, of swimming, uh, golfing, or even just gardening or, or you know, uh, various different things like that, we want to know because our, our uh, process and decision-making and, and exercises are shaped around that. Um, and then just, we're going to assess you objectively, um, looking at your healing status. Uh, we're going to take a look at the incision, make sure uh, everything's kind of healed nicely there. Um, uh, kind of checking for signs of inflammation, uh, swelling, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and then just checking for issues and complications on the way. Uh, we see you quite often potentially after that uh, in this, uh, this first few weeks. And um, you know we're, we're communicating with the physician about some of these issues you may run into, but they're, 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 they're rare, but they do happen where you may have an infection or a dislocation or a malalignment or something like that. And we'll be checking for that kind of along the way. Um, and, and usually on that first day, you're gonna be going home with a good amount of things to do at home. This sort of recovery is one that you, you have to have an active role in. So uh, we're gonna send you home with some exercises to be doing and, and, and uh, uh, make sure you understand what, what you can and can't do and that sort of thing. Um, starting off, I uh, just kind of give you a, a overview of the rehab guidelines. This is for a total shoulder. Again, this is anatomic, meaning uh, the ball in the socket is what is uh, what would be in a normal shoulder. Um, I've seen people start PT soon, uh, within a week. Um, sometimes it's, it's a little later, depending on uh, a bunch of different factors that the surgeon usually will, will decide upon. But um, you're starting uh, moving it fairly soon, and, and you're going to be in a sling most likely for up to six weeks. Again, it kind of depends on. Uh, the extent of the surgery and, and a couple and a few uh, various other factors, but uh, really only removing the sling to, to, to bathe, uh, to do your home exercises, and then during PT we'll be removing it as well and just kind of um, you know, uh, doing range of motion, strength, and that sort of thing. Um, so um, another important thing to note is we don't want you with this first six weeks is very important um, not reaching behind your back. Uh, as Dr. Harrison mentioned, the subscapularis muscle, a very very important rotator cuff muscle, is cut and uh, during the surgery. And it's very, very important that this muscle heals and it heals mostly in this first six week period. This is where blood flow uh, is kind of returning to that muscle and it can start to heal and maintain or, and, and uh, get its function back. If in this first six weeks, it takes a lot of damage or a lot of stress, uh, your outcomes are, are significantly affected going forward. So we say no reaching behind your back for at least six weeks. And some people say, I don't reach behind my back. It's not a thing I do. Reaching for your wallet, very casual, very, very common thing people do. That is what we're talking about. None of that. Not reaching behind your back to get up from a chair um, is another thing that we do almost subconsciously. So it's important not to do those things. And then, uh, you know, uh, for, for the ladies, reaching behind your back to um, undo or strap a bra. Another thing you definitely don't want to be doing in this first six weeks to protect that subscapularis. Um, this first we, one to six week period is our range, our, our focus is on range of motion. Um, we're doing things for your you know, elbow, wrist, hand, just making sure that's maintains and your strength doesn't, uh, or range of motion det doesn't deteriorate. Um, but also just doing some uh, light pendulums, which are, are a uh, kind of a passive circular motion just to make sure it stays limber and loose, uh, as well as just getting your, um, making sure your posture is maintained uh, while you're in this first six week period where you're not usually using the, 
shoulder that much. Uh, so it's not stuff, stuff like scapula or squeezes, just so they're, um, like I said, maintain that appropriate posture. And this is where, in this first six week period, we're also gonna start to move it uh, and have you move it as well. Um, you know, we'll start with what's called passive range of motion, which is where you are not actively moving your limb. You are either uh, moving it with your other arm or a therapist is assisting in the motion. Um, you know, mostly working on in front of your body, forward motion, um, some out to the side and some um, rotation out to the side as well. We're not gonna go into excessive degrees of that rotation out to the side, because again, that could potentially stress um, that subscapularis muscle just from overstretching, and we wanna make sure it scars down and heals nicely. Um, so we're gonna avoid that excessive kind of external rotated out to the side motion, almost like you're waving high to somebody. We're not gonna be doing something like that in that first six weeks. And uh, another important note uh, in this time, first uh, time period is it, we're not doing anything actively uh, in extension or behind your body or uh, internal rotation, or, which is across your body, um, not actively at least, because it's, again, subscapularis, very important in this, in this situation, and that would stress it. Uh, and we're progressing the passive range of motion, which is called active assist. That's essentially where you're, um, you're only help, you're, you're helping that body part move, but only a little bit. So it's, you're using it, but getting assist still um, from it. So usually it's from a cane um, or, or some other uh, dowel or something like that. Um, and then once, passively and, and active assistively, you can do these motions, will progress you to you doing it on your own uh, without any assist. And, and, and uh, you know, I, in this first six, eight week period, we're building up to getting that full or uh, close to full range of motion, um, I would expect. Um, you know, moving on to the six, 12 week range, uh, this is where we're gonna be, uh, you know, kind of maximizing your range of motion, for, um, uh, kind of maximizing your range of motion and just starting to strengthen. Uh, we'll start with things like isometrics, which is essentially where you're turning on the muscle, but it's not really, um, you're not really moving your arm, uh, usually with a wall or something like that. Um, you know, this is mainly just to retrain the muscle, make sure it's ready to be loaded again and, and that it doesn't deteriorate in strength. You're not going to get super strong pushing into a wall, but um, again, it's, it's, it's an important first step. And then progressing to what's called isotonics, which is just essentially just where you're moving, actually moving your limb and the muscle is changing during that um, process. So stuff like bands, weights, we will progress to that point in this time period as well. Important note again, uh, we're not going to be doing, I mentioned subscapularis, no active across your body, no active pulling behind. Um, in this still six to 12 week period, we're not going to be doing anything resistant. I mean, you may start to use it, but we're not going to be loading and resisting um, uh, internal rotation or extension, which would be your uh, stressing your subscapularis. Uh, and then, you know, finally we get to the point where you're three months out, um, three month to 12 month mark, uh, we're really maximizing your strength here and actually starting to load that subscap a bit, going through that same process, isometric, isotonic in that way. Uh, and then just focusing on uh, advanced rotator cuff um, strength as well as uh, scapular strength and stability. Maybe doing some uh, weight bearing stuff, depending on what your sport or activity you're trying to get back to, we will um, be implementing some of those things there. Um, and again, a, a note about the rotator cuff with, with the total shoulder, not the reverse, you do still have a rotator cuff available to use and, and it, the stability of the shoulder is dependent upon it. So a lot of the focus will be on making sure that rotator cuff functions well and that it's strong. Um, moving on to, you know, the reverse uh, total shoulder, like I said, it, it, from the outside, when you look at a, uh, a rehab program or even at this uh, presentation, they look similar, um, but they're definitely not the same. Um, your, your reverse total shoulder, um, usually you restrict your motion for a bit longer. Uh, this sling use and that sort of thing, again, is dependent uh, on, on a variety of factors. But what I see more often than not is that people are restricted for at least six weeks, likely not moving the shoulder at all, um, uh, and maybe and likely not even going to PT in that, in that time period because they're wanting it really, again, because you don't have a rotator cuff where it's least efficient, that works, it doesn't work very well. And they're trying to maximize the ability for that joint to stabilize and for that implant that they put in there to stabilize. Uh, so again, less motion in, this, in, this, um, in the reverse. Uh, and then uh, usually we're slower to progress the range of motion again early on and a slower progression throughout that first, throughout that first three months. Um, and then as you know, Dr. Erickson mentioned, um, you're gonna be relying more heavily on that deltoid, big mu meaty muscle on the outside of your arm, as well as this, the uh, muscles that surround your shoulder blade. Um, you're gonna be relying on those muscles to get your motion and to keep your stability uh, more so than just the regular total, sh uh, total shoulder replacement. So, you know, depending on, um, you know, variety of factors, this is really patient specific, it may be that we're focusing weight more heavily on those uh, muscle groups. 
uh, and challenging them in different ways than we would with, with a total shoulder. Um, so overall rehab guidelines, um, you're going to be doing home exercises immediately, usually post-op, but again, those do usually don't involve too much shoulder motion. Um, uh, and usually formal PT won't begin for, for, the, for the first six weeks. Um, Sling use, again, six weeks minimum. When we we're removing for bathing and home exercise programs. Uh, and then same kind of concept here. Um, no reaching behind your back um, for at least six weeks. Um, this is one to protect the, uh, this is again to protect the instability, protect the against instability of the implant they put in there. Um, and then though this extreme motion, we could stress that the structures they put in there and, and make it looser. And you definitely don't want that because this, this uh, surgery is inherently more unstable than the, um, uh, than the reverse due to the lack of the rotator cuff or than the, than the anatomic due to the lack of the rotator cuff. Um, so looking at the home exercises you're going to get in that first six week period, uh, it looks very similar to that very, very beginning stage of um, the anatomic, except uh, we don't have the shoulder uh, motion in this one. So again, act, active elbow and wrist, gripping exercises, uh, pendulums, as well as just getting your posture and your shoulder blade in, in a better position with some scat squeezes and that sort of thing. Um, week six to 12, this is where it looks like that, uh, that first segment of the uh, um, anatomic uh, rehab is we're starting to move the shoulder after six weeks. So uh, again, starting with passive range of motion um, and progressing to active assist and active range of motion is tolerated um, is the same, it's a similar kind of uh, progression there. Uh, looking at uh, in this six week, 12 week period, this is where we're gonna start doing more uh, strengthening as well. So it's a busy time period in this, in this, uh, in this range. But again, starting with isometrics, progress, progressing to isotonics, uh, where you're actually moving your arm, using a band, using, using a weight. Uh, usually, we're also still with this uh, uh, program and with a reverse, we're still gonna be avoiding uh, resisted ex, uh, internal rotation or across your body and extension because um, of the same kind of concept. They have the, the decision and the, and the um, cut into the subscapular is still the same. You want to maintain that the health of that uh, muscle as best you can to, um, due to the fact that you have a rot deficient rotator cuff anyway. Let's make sure we maintain that, that, that muscle's ability to um, you know, be strong in the future. So uh, still avoiding that motion. Uh, months three to 12, uh, this looks very, very similar to that, to the, um, just the regular anatomic. It's virtually the same. We're gonna be focusing on uh, getting the, uh, advancing the rotator cuff strength, progressing the more advanced uh, shoulder blade strength and stability, and then focusing on your uh, kind of return to sport, return to recreation um, kind of activities. Um, looking at manually or, or when the physical therapist may be putting their hands on you, massaging, manipulating, moving around, uh, this is kind of just an overview of what that, what that may look like. So in that first six week period, this is where it's gonna be dependent on the type of surgery, whether it's anatomic or reverse, but therapists may be assisting with that passive range of motion um, uh, in, in the various plans we discussed. Um, and they, they also may be performing stretching and various types of myofascial massage uh, techniques uh, to the surrounding area. So you're, you have muscles that surround your shoulder blade that weren't as effective in this surgery, like your pec, your pec muscles, as well as the, shoulder, the muscles that surround your shoulder blade. Um, you don't want those to be a source of possible dysfunction um, in the meantime while you're rehabbing. So maybe doing some amount of stretching and, and uh, massage of that. Um, in week six to 12 is where we may start depending on, uh, this is very patient dependent, but we may start doing some very light joint mobilization, but it really just depends on the person. Some people are, um, don't need this, this, um, this intervention, but some people come out of it after that first six weeks and they stiffened up a lot and we may need to get, out, get after it a little bit more. Um, this is where we're actually um, you know, getting at the shoulder joint and, and, and stretching it instead of just a muscle. But again, as I said, this is, this is something that's, heavily patient dependent on what, what their actual deficits are. Um, and we usually won't do this sort of uh, joint mobilizations uh, for a reverse until, until at least that 12 week mark again because of the stability of that um, implant. Um, but uh, months three to 12 is where we may start, if you're still lacking some amount of range of motion, we'll be, be a little bit more aggressive for some longer duration holds um, and in range kind of like um, stretching just to make sure we can maximize your uh, motion there. Um, I put this uh, article in, I think it's really kind of important to talk about. I think people look at a total shoulder replacement as if it's maybe a death sentence to their ability to play tennis, their ability to, you know, uh, swim, their ability to um, do various things. And I think this is really uh, an interesting article that was published in 2017. Um, uh, and it took very, a very large uh, 
case st- or sorry, a very large sample size of, of um, several hundred people rehabbing from uh, total shoulder as well as reverse total shoulders. Um, and they found that overall there was 85% return to doing their uh, activity uh, or sport of choice. So um, that's very good that uh, that's 85% of people are getting back to doing the activities they like to be doing. Um, and with 72% returning to that prior and or even slightly improved level of performance even. Um, with the total shoulder, you're gonna see a little bit better um, uh, chances of this happening. 92.6% of people are gonna return to doing that activity. And a little, and a little less with the reverse um, uh, for a variety of factors, but usually because of the, the uh, strength, stability, that sort of thing. So, um, but yeah, like I said, the name's uh, Derek. Uh, uh, put my contact information on here. Obviously, anyone feel free to shoot me an email, uh, call that number if you ever need to schedule an appointment or talk to a physical therapist. I'm more than happy to help or answer any questions. Um, they said I work for Spear Physical Therapy. We're an um, orthopedic uh, sports private practice in, in New York as well as Queens, Brooklyn, um, and uh, Westchester with 22 locations across the city. So um, uh, feel free to you know, give us a call at any of our locations. We're more than happy to, to, to help and, and get started with some physical therapy. That's all I got. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Derek, for um, all the information. And thank you, Dr. Erickson, as well, for uh, your, represent, uh, your presentation. Um, we'd, I'd like to now open up the forum to any questions that the audience might have. I did get emailed a couple questions, and I saw some uh, during the chat. Um, so uh, first question is, do you prefer patients try all non-operative treatments prior to surgery, or do you ever see a reason to move them straight to surgery? Yeah, it's pretty much, it's pretty patient specific for me. Um, you know, sometimes people come in, you know, their shoulder bothers them a couple times a week. They're still doing everything they want to do, maybe made some minor modifications and haven't tried anything yet. Those are the people that do very well from physical therapy, sometimes injections, uh, and can really get the shoulder in a good place. Because, you know, listen, if you don't need the shoulder replacement, we don't want to do it. We want to do shoulder replacements on people that need it. So if it's somebody who comes in, they've been modifying the, modifying their activity for the last couple of years, they have terrible bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, they can't lift their shoulder past here, well, Derek can work on them all day, but he's not going to get their shoulder motion much better if there's literally a mechanical block to it. So those are the people where non-operative treatment is probably not worthwhile to try. We certainly can. There's no harm in it. It just kind of delays things. Um, and those are the people that oftentimes will benefit from just having their shoulder replaced and then seeing Derek to get the motion and everything back to get them to having a normal life. Uh, anything to add, Derek, or should I go to the uh, next question? That is, that, that, that's exactly right. I mean, I think I've, I've seen, um, again, I think it depends on uh, the, maybe the rationale for the surgery. If, if someone uh, came to see doc, Dr. Erickson or the um, other physician and, and uh, they had a significant issue that was like, that's definitely not gonna get better. But again, I, I see people way more often than not uh, coming to at least try something or even some amount of prehabilitation or getting in and at least making sure it's strong going into surgery, knowing you're gonna get it, makes for better outcomes. But um, you know, most, most people are coming in uh, first. And a follow up to that question actually is, uh, in your experience, do medical carriers require that you go through other treatment before you have surgery? No, it uh, depends on the carrier, but oftentimes not. They, they usually trust us to make the right decision. So if somebody has horrible arthritis and they can't move their shoulder and they want to replace, they, they oftentimes don't see the benefit in, you know, in doing the other things. Um, but that's carrier specific. Gotcha. And um, another patient asked, can you be dislocating your shoulder during an activity and not even realize that you're doing it? Well, it'd be hard to not realize you were doing it. I don't know. What do you think, Derek? It, you'd usually feel a click and a clunk back and forth. So it, you can, sometimes it can get to the rim and not come all the way out. And sometimes that you won't notice. But when it comes out and it goes back, it's usually pretty obvious. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that it's, it's, it's something you'll definitely notice. I mean, I, I think people, the shoulder is a very common joint to get instability in, in general. So uh, people will feel like, oh, that doesn't feel right. Or that felt like it slipped around a little bit. Or like you mentioned, like a click or a clunk or something like that. Um, but if it came out, it's, it's definitely very noticeable. Um, but, but instability, instability is something that maybe go under the radar, but yeah. Uh, another, uh, patient did ask, um, in your time, uh, working with professional athletes, have you ever seen 
someone at the elite level have shoulder replacement and return to that professional sport? Um, generally not because in the athletes that I work with, they're usually in their twenties to maybe forties. And so generally not always, but generally those patients are not having shoulder replacements. More commonly it's the coaches who are throwing batting practice that, uh, maybe shoulder replacements. And, and a follow up to that one, uh, that question was also the, the case, the scenario is a pitcher and it's post career. Um, is that more often, do you see a lot of pitchers in baseball getting shoulder replacement? No, it's interesting. Actually, no, uh, we don't see that as often. Usually pitchers will have things like rotator cuff tears where oftentimes we'll have to fix them down the road. Um, but shoulder replacements, at least in my experience, we don't actually see a lot of old professional pitchers that have them. Usually more of a football injury where they had a lot of trauma to their shoulder. They've beaten their shoulder up over time. Maybe an offensive lineman. They usually wind up having shoulder arthritis. Yeah. I, I, you know, to add to that, I, as far as like professional athletes go, um, you know, I also haven't really seen much of that, but I have seen a high level, uh, very high level kind of like kayaking and that sort of thing. I mean, and, and you know, uh, pretty recreational tennis, uh, you know, competitive tennis at that, at, at that age. But um, I, saw, I saw it, I had a patient once that had, it was amazing, had double uh, shoulder replacements and he was a competitive in his age bracket uh, kayaker. And it was, it was incredible. I mean, he almost, he had almost full range of motion and was able to compete again. But yeah, it's usually a surgery um, in an elderly population and returning to that sport at that level usually isn't happening anyway. Uh, another question that just came in is, what would you consider successful ROM results following both types of shoulder replacement? Yeah, so when we talk about range of motion, um, certainly different between a, an anatomic and a reverse. So for an anatomic, I really want to get you back up to at least 160 to 170 degrees up here. Um, usually external rotation to the side, I want to get you to at least 30, 40, oftentimes more degrees. And then internal rotation, certainly to your lower lumbar spine. For a reverse, usually want to get you to about 140 would be a good result up here. Um, at the side, usually about 40 again. And the thing with the reverse that gets a little bit difficult sometimes is that internal rotation to get behind your back. So some people do very well. Some people have a little bit of limitation there, but those are kind of the differences for me at least. Yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. Just in the difference between the two, that's that's on hundred percent on par. I, uh, you know, I think a lot of it is dependent on uh, prior history of it, right? I mean, if they went ten years without being able to reach too far overhead, um, without significant pain or, or severe stiffness, I mean, sometimes it, it can be harder to get uh, a ton of motion back, and then maybe you'll see some fluctuations there. But yeah, with an anatomic, you should be completely functional, and you won't you should notice it a ton. Uh, the reverse likely a little a little different, especially behind the back for sure. So. Great, thank you. And uh, another question that we received is: if you've had a replacement already, but haven't seen any improvement in a two to three year span, um, would that call for a revision of that surgery? Yeah, it depends. You, I'd want to see the patient and evaluate them and see what was going on because it depends on where they're at. You know, if if they're at 140 degrees after a reverse, but they want to be a little higher, then no. Um, if they're having a shoulder replacement that feels unstable, they can't get their arm up past here, then sometimes, yes, sometimes they can benefit from a revision, but it, it's kind of patient specific. Great. And um, are there certain pre or post surgical um, prognostic indicators that would tell you whether or not a patient will recover well from shoulder replacement surgery, especially with respect to returning to recreational activities? Uh, sometimes, as Derek alluded to before, kind of preoperative function can help us determine how well they do afterwards. Uh, we definitely will improve function, but the better function they have sometimes before, oftentimes the better they'll have after. Um, there are some anatomical things. I showed some images before about what the socket looks like. When the socket starts to get worn away a lot or when it starts to form that other concavity, those can be difficult patients because there's not a lot of bone stock uh, on the socket side of the shoulder, different than a hip and a knee where there's a lot of um, a lot of bone stock to work with. In the shoulder, there's much less. And so sometimes when you start to wear away a lot of the bone in the shoulder, that can be a little bit difficult. Um, the other thing that will sometimes be an issue is depending on the, the cause of the arthritis. If the arthritis is just regular osteoarthritis or if it's because the rotator cuff is not functioning, those people do generally do very well after surgery. Somebody who has a post-traumatic arthritis or maybe a rheumatoid arthritis or um, has had many surgeries in the past on their shoulder and that's how they got their arthritis, the, uh, the outcomes for those people are a little bit more unpredictable. Um, not to say that they won't be good, but they're a little bit more unpredictable. Yeah, yeah 100%. I think. Awesome. I've, 
uh, educate patients that are considering getting this surgery. It's, and they're asking me, well, what would I, what would I be able to do and what's it look like? It's definitely a tough question to, to answer to some degree. There's a lot of factors that go into it, but I usually tell people tape, you know, to temper their expectations given their, what they've been able to do in their prior level of function. If you haven't swam for 10 years, and don't reach overhead for that long, it's, it's unlikely that, that that's going to return, right? So it's, it, it may shoot for it and we may try, but um, it, that gets tougher when that's the, when that's the case. Great, and uh, I think that's all the questions that we have for now. Um, I want to uh, thank uh, Derek and uh, Dr. Arison for doing this. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. Uh, for more information, or if you'd like to make an appointment with one of our physicians, you can visit uh, us at rothmanny.com, uh, or you can call us to make an appointment at 888-636. 7840. Uh, or if you'd like to make an appointment with Derek, you can visit spearcenter.com um, or you can call and make an appointment there at 212 759 2282. And uh, just so as a reminder to everyone, uh, we'll be sending out this recording to all registrants within the next uh, couple of days. So please be on the lookout for that email. Uh, thank you everyone for your time. Thanks, Reggie. Thanks, Derek. Yeah, thanks, guys. Appreciate it.